Okay. So um, just real quick, this, this limit is going to come up later today in the lecture. So I wanted us to all be ready for it. Does anyone remember what this limit is? If I want to go answer this limit, what would it be? Someone saying zero, someone else saying one. One of those is correct. Yeah, one, okay, good. Um, zero is a good, I mean, when, it, when you're doing limits, I think like good guesses are zero or one or does not exist or infinity. And like, those are like really good guesses. And then um, uh, in this case, there's a few ways to look at it. The, the proper way to do it is using a, um, a squeeze theorem, but figuring out what to squeeze in here, uh, this between is, is actually um, a, a little more complicated. So one over one minus cosine of X over X is uh, a different problem. And that one goes to zero. Um, but this one, you can use like a squeeze theorem thing. But um, I think once you learn L'Hopital's rule, this one becomes much easier to remember, right? Because you get zero over uh, zero over zero. So you just use L'Hopital's rule and you get cosine of T over one. And so then when you plug in zero to that, uh, you just get one, right? So L'Hopital's rule makes this much easier. Technically, you're not supposed to use L'Hopital's rule because for silly technical reasons, technically that's, uh, uh, you're using this limit uh, to take the derivative secretly. So um, to use L'Hopital's rule, you also already have to have the derivative. So um, that's technically not correct, but uh, using L'Hopital's rule to remember what this is equal to is, I think, totally fine. Okay, good, uh, good talk there. I'm glad we're all uh, remembering that, even if you if you don't remember all the details of how that works. Now it's all kind of fresh in our brain, and it'll it'll come up in just um, later in the uh, in the lecture, and actually the next section. Okay. So let's transition to back to uh, section 2.1. Okay, so we were here. Uh, well, we were just past here with doing some examples and I'll get to them in a second, but I wanna answer this question regarding scalar and vector valued functions. So in general, a function is scalar valued when it only has one output and is vector valued when it has more than one app. Uh, uh, one more than one output. That's exactly right. So just the key thing to remember is the word valued has to do with outputs. The word variables typically means inputs. So, um, and these two are valued. So we're talking about the outputs. In other words, the range. Um, here it's R1, which means the outputs are scalars or just numbers. Um, and uh, over here, the output is uh, vectors uh, in RM which is uh, vectors. So um, it has multiple outputs, right? It has more than one output in terms of how many real number outputs it has, okay? So we were looking at some examples here. So this first example was single variable scalar valued because it, it only took in one thing and it spit out one thing. This one took in multiple things, so several variable, but it was still scalar valued because once you get those two numbers, you just squared them and added them together, that's just gonna spit out a number. So this just spits out a number, okay? And now we have part three here, which as we can see, uh, the input is X, Y, Z, which means it's gonna be several variables, right? Because it takes in more than one variable. Remember in this case, several just means more than one. Um, and we see the outputs. Um, and like, I think the big tip off here is like the big parentheses and all the commas, right? Um, but the point is that with these three numbers, I do three different things with it and I just kind of write them as a list. That's what we call a vector. So this is vector valued. Um, and then now this last one is kind of, you know, I've, you see I've done every possible combination except for one. This is single variable. Because there's only one input and the output has Three, three real numbers uh, as output, so that's vector valued. Cool. And I'll pause there for you to give you a chance to catch up on writing all that. 
Okay. Okay. Cool. Feel free to slow me down if you have any questions. Um, so far, it's just uh, the only types of problems we've done is like identifying by looking at a function. Can you tell if it's vector valued, scalar valued, single variable, or several variable? Um, and you can see here we have kind of every combination. And there's a few problems like this on the homework too. Like, is this vector value? Uh, sometimes they won't even ask for both things. It's just asking, is it vector valued or scalar valued? And it doesn't care about several variable or single variable. It just is asking vector valued or, or scalar valued. Um, so you can kind of take a look at that and, and figure it out. Okay. Cool. Okay. So this is just kind of learning the basics of what kind of functions are going to look like. But we can actually start, you know, doing stuff with the functions. For example, when we first learned about functions back in the day and like regular and like single variable, single, uh, single variable, what we now call single variable scalar valued functions. Right, those are the functions that we've been studying since, I don't know, when you start studying functions like middle school. Um, and you learn how to graph them, right? You learn how to graph a bunch of things. You learn how to graph lines. You learn how to graph parabolas. Um, and so functions in um, higher dimensions also have uh, graphs, okay? Um, so for example, in a function in n dimensions, or if it, it, it takes um, Rn to R, notice that there's just an R here, there's no uh, power here. So it's just, it this, this would be a, a several variable scalar valued function. Um, it, can, it has a graph which lives in Rn plus one. Okay, so what does that mean here? So for example, this function here, right, is a function from R to R. So the graph, Right, if we have a, 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 a function in one, a, a single variable function that with scalar outputs, the graph, like we've said um, before, is just the graphs that we used to do, um, you know, we've been doing since, since we started learning how to graph, right? It, it's, it lives on the XY plane, which is um, R2, right? It's two dimensional space, even though it's a one dimensional input, one dimensional output, the uh, graph lives uh, in two-dimensional space. And the graph of this function, for example, is this parabola that does something like this, okay? Right? I didn't draw it super precisely, but you know, the more precise you, the more precise you are, the more calculated points you have, the more pretty your graph will be. But you know, this I kind of just gave a rough picture of the graph, okay? Now, what about over here? Let's look over here. So, you know, I'll give you a second to, to, to draw this, but if we move on to this, you know, this, this is just kind of an example that, you know, we've already kind of seen before, maybe just in a new context. Here we have another function, but this one takes in two variables. So it goes, the domain is R2 and it spits out a number, it's scalar value. So it goes from R2 to R. So, the domain of this, or sorry, the graph of this is gonna live in R3. So the graph lives in R3. Now, is it possible for us to draw this? Totally, and like people have been doing that for centuries, graphing in three dimensions and like trying to draw that. Um, but I think for this, you know, we, we, you know we've, we have technology now, so there's better ways to graph this than trying to sit here and, and figure out how to graph it um, on a um, two-dimensional plane. And later on, we're gonna learn some methods so that we don't have to, uh, so we don't have to try to figure out what the 3D graph looks like, what the graph looks like living in three dimensions, okay? So we're gonna learn some methods in a bit. But um, we can graph this using the calculator. Um, and I'm gonna calculator, I'm gonna switch screens here to, um, an online graphing calculator called GeoGebra. Okay, you might know something like Desmos as a as an online graphing calculator. That one, uh, De unfortunately, Desmos doesn't do three D graphs or, or you know graphs like this that live in three dimensions. So um, uh, GeoGebra can handle that. Um, GeoGebra is not quite as intuitive to use 
um, but it's very similar to Desmos if you've ever used that. And so let me switch screens here to make sure that we can get to, that we can all see what I see. So can everyone see that? You should be able to see this now, this like 3D graph here, okay? So if you're wondering how to get to this, um, there is, uh, I just went to, I, you could just Google GeoGebra, which I just wrote down for you, uh, G-E-O-G-E-B-R-A, right? Um, you can also um, go directly to the website. I think they have a version that you can download and just use without even uh, going online. Now, if you open it up the first time, it might not look like this, um, you have to go up here, which it's, I think it's getting a little cut off in, my, in, in, in what you're seeing, but just there's a button up here and you can probably see this drop down menu here. Um, there's these different versions. And I think by default, you're in graphing mode. Um, you just switch to 3D calculator if you go to GeoGebra um, and you just make sure you click on 3D calculator so that you're actually in this 3D mode. Um, and I like to change up, you know, there's settings over here that you can play with and change the colors of everything. I think the one thing I'm gonna do is take off the color from those um, and maybe make the um, font a little bigger so you can all see what I'm doing. Okay, cool. Uh, there. Okay, so you can kind of use your mouse to rotate around here. If you have a touch screen, it's probably even better. You can scroll with the scroll wheel. Um, and you can kind of move around. Um, but we don't have anything on this graph yet. So if you remember the function we were trying to graph, it was f of x comma y. And this was equal to x squared. So I just used the caret there to give me a squared. Um, and now it's going to keep me in the exponent. So I hit the right key to make sure that I'm down here and not still in the exponent. And then I add to that y squared. And you can see here it's given me um, a nice, uh, picture of what's going on. This shape, right, it's almost like a parabola. It's got that same kind of parabolic shape, but it's like it's like a parabola that you've rotated, right? If you remember from single variable calculus, the one time we talked about spaces, uh, shapes in 3D was um, uh, surfaces of, and, and volumes of revolution. Um, this is like the surface of revolution of a parabola around the z-axis, right? Um, and so you can kind of take that as your picture. Um, the fancy word for this is a paraboloid. So a, par a paraboloid is kind of this this more you know three dimensional object. This is the kind of shape they'd use in like engineering for like the the nose of a plane or a rocket or something. Okay. Okay. So this is kind of the shape that uh, you'd get from that that graph. Okay. This is going to be a very helpful tool this quarter. This is not the last time you'll see it here in lecture. Um, and it's something that you should probably have bookmarked so that, you know, as you're going through the homework and you're like, I need to visualize this, especially if you really like, like if you're, if you're usually the type of person to draw a picture and you find yourself finding it hard to draw pictures in, in this class, this is a good tool to, you know, use to draw the pictures for you. Okay. And just in general, like if you click around and you start messing with it, you can probably get really good at it and, and do really neat stuff. Okay, any questions? Okay, cool. Okay, now let me switch screens back to um, the notes and we can move on. So um, again, I don't expect you to be able to draw this like copy this down in your notes, but you can just kind of leave yourself a note to use GeoGebra to, to, to graph it. Okay, let me switch back to these notes. Uh, there they are. Okay, cool. So um, in general, you know, you can use computers to help you graph these things. You know, there are old school ways of figuring out how to graph these things. You can also like uh, kind of plug plug in some points and try to get an idea of what's good, what the picture is. Um, once you get used to some some popular functions like this one, like you should probably be able to look at it and say, like, "Hey, that looks like a paraboloid." Um, 
um, but we can you can kind of use use things like that. Um, you can also convert to polar coordinates or whatever, and sometimes that makes it easier to see what the picture is trying to trying to uh, make. Okay. Cool. So let's switch to let's go to the next um, uh, topic here, which is uh, level sets. So basically, what you should be picturing when we talk about level sets, um, and you know this paragraph explains it. But if oh that uh, there's a typo here. This should be R one uh, or just R. Okay. Um, Basically, what you should be picturing is imagine that graph we just pulled up on GeoGebra. And what we're doing is we're taking planes at certain heights along the, of, of the z-axis. So just take, like, here's your z-axis. Just take a certain height and just put a plane there. And we're imagining that plane is just like a knife that's chopping the graph, okay? And you're saying, okay, what shape does the is left on that plane when you chop at that level, okay? That's what we call them level sets. Level meaning you pick a certain level of the z-axis, you chop there. And then you see what uh, what your shape looks like on that plane, okay? And then we can totally graph those on the um, uh, on an, just thinking of that plane as like an x y plane. You can graph those, okay? Cool. Um, so I'll give you a second to. Oh, I didn't. I haven't finished writing a set. A set. This is not a full sentence here, but so like the formal definition. Um, if you have a function here, this is a, a, a several variable function with scalar values, um, and you want to take the level set at C. So maybe I can even highlight um, this. Like this is the word we're defining here. So maybe I can I think I usually use green for definitions. So level set of a function uh, at a certain level C is the subset of the domain satisfying uh, the equation f of x, um, uh, I guess x1 through xn, right? Because the domain is in several variables, equals c. Okay, so this is like the key here. We're looking at, you know, the, all of the outputs or all of the inputs which give you this, uh, this value c as an output. Okay, so that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking for all of the inputs which give you the value C as an output. Okay. And we'll see some examples here in just a second. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, hopefully you had some a chance to write all of this down. Again, as uh, just as like a note, when you're writing things down, um, if you, um, I do post the notes later. So if you uh, kind of can't keep up or something, then just make sure you've you've got enough to kind of, uh, uh, like a, enough of a sketch that you can kind of come fill it in later. Someone's asking, should we consider C as a number instead of a point? Yeah, absolutely. So C is like a value, like an output, a possible output for this function, which the outputs here are numbers. So it's a, it's a number, a point on the z-axis, which is basically a number you can think of. Okay, cool, good question. Okay, so let's plot these, uh, a few examples of level sets. So we're seeing this function that we saw earlier, right? We know what the graph of that thing looks like. It looks like this big parabola, right? But what we want to look at is um, just what happens when c equals 4, OK? So when c equals 4, we're looking at, so we're looking for, looking for x, y in R2 such that x squared plus y squared is equal to four, right? So I plug these into my function and I see uh, which ones give me this value C as an output, this number C as an output, okay? In this case, we're looking for the values uh, in R2, which give you X squared plus Y squared equals four, okay? 
Well, now that we look at this equation, what does this equation represent? What's the, you know, if I tried to plot this equation, what does that look like? What shape would that be? X squared plus Y squared equals four is a circle. Yeah, so if I plot this um, on my X, Y plane, so I draw something like this and like this, okay. And then I give myself um, give myself some help and I do something like this, okay? And we imagine that I drew this well um, and nice and centered. And we say that this, this, just imagine that this distance here is four, okay? I didn't draw it using the dots correctly, but you can kind of assume that I did. Um, and so this radius, uh, not four, what should that uh, radius actually be? I, I did the common mistake of using this number, but what should I be using instead of four? Two, yeah, remember x squared plus y squared equals r squared, right, the radius squared. So um, four is the radius squared. So that means the radius is two. Cool, good catch. Um, so this is the level set at c equals four, okay? Now alone, this is kind of like, okay, that's kind of neat. But um, if you think back to the graph and I can pull it up, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to give you, let you see this still so that you can write it down. Um, the graph was like this was, like I said, it's called a paraboloid. So it looked like this, right? If I cut at any height, it was going to give me a circle. Okay. But the interesting part was that if I cut at different heights, the radius of the circle is what's changing right? The radius of the circle changes as you move higher and, or, and then it gets smaller as you go lower, right? And so that's kind of the picture we can see here, okay? Um, though all we're getting here is one specific level set. We don't, you know, just from this one picture, we don't necessarily know that they're, you're going to get circles get, get bigger as you go, as C gets higher and smaller as C gets lower, okay? Um, okay, cool. So let's see a few more, okay? So let's uh, give ourselves some space, okay. So here, oops. we're still looking for, we're looking now for x, y in R2 such that uh, x plus y equals two, okay? So now one skill that like, one skill that technically you should have learned already or should have been developing um, that you're gonna have to tap into is looking at certain types of equations and saying, hey, what shape does that make? Like over here I asked said, x squared plus y squared equals four, what shape does that make? You know, you, we, we got, we landed on circle, right? Um, if you remember anything about, um, what are they called? Uh, conic sections. Some of those are gonna come up a little bit later too. Now, where I'm not saying you should be an absolute expert on conic sections, right? You have a chance as you're going through the homework, when you get to a problem, you look at this and you're like, okay, X plus Y equals two. This one's not too bad, but if it, later we're gonna see some that are not super clear what they're supposed to be, um, but you can uh, kind of, maybe you know do a little bit of research and try to try to re relearn how you know the different conic sections uh get graphed but in this one this one is not a conic section what uh, shape does this graph make it's not usually you don't we don't usually write the shape in this the equation for the shape in, in this form but it's a pretty simple shape yeah it's just a regular line right we don't usually write it in this form this is what we would call standard form for a line, but we usually use a uh, point slope form, or not point slope, uh, slope intercept form, right? But if you move the X over, you'd have Y equals negative X plus two, which definitely looks like a line. Um, and so the way that looks on the graph um, is the Y intercept is two and the slope is negative one. So you end up, you can, whenever I see uh, X plus Y equals some number, I just, you just go to that number on the X axis, go to that number on the, or go to the number on the y-axis, go to that number on the x-axis, and then just connect those with the line. Uh -uh. 
Okay. Oh, not bad. Not bad. Got, got away from me at the end there. But um, yeah, so this is the line here. Um, now you might be thinking, okay, what does the shape, what does this graph look like if the, if the, um, the equation, if the, the level set is a line, remember, there's some graph existing in 3D space, and I just chopped it at, z, at c equals two, or you know, at the height two, and I got this line, right? So the question is, what does the actual graph look like? Anyone have an idea of what the graph would look like for this function without cheating and just looking at and just plugging it into GeoGebra? Anyone have an idea? Right. You can see that if we changed this number, we'd still just get a line. It would just be in a different place. It would actually be like moving across this way. Yeah, so it's a plane. So it's like this plane that's coming in at, at a weird angle. Okay. And then when we chop it, we just get this line. And if we chopped it slightly higher, the line would move. And then if we chopped it lower, they would move in the other direction. Okay. Cool. So... Actually, I think I want to show off that trick, what exactly I'm talking about. Um, do I? Maybe I want to wait a little bit, see what's on the next slide. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to wait just a little bit to show you exactly what I mean by that. But let's do this last level set here. Um, there are this last problem when we're looking for a level set um, here, number three. So, number three, now we're looking for. Um, X, Y, Z in R3. Um, such that X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared equals one. What shape is that? Notice that this lives now not in two dimensional space, but in three dimensional space. What shape is, is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one? Yeah, it's the sphere of radius one. Right, just like x squared plus y squared equals one is the circle of radius one in R2, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is the sphere of radius one in R3. So when I draw a sphere, I usually draw a circle and then something like this. And then I usually draw like a dotted line going around the back to kind of show that it's a sphere now my sphere is a little wobbly there but you know this is you can take the idea here that this is a sphere of radius one so this distance here is one okay cool any questions on that so the weird thing here the nice thing about this one here, and then it's kind of related to something I mentioned the other day when we we're talking about higher dimensions, is that there's no way we can, there's no computer program that shows us the graph of this function, right? Because right over here, we have maps from R2 to R. So the graphs live in three dimensions. Here we have a graph from R or a map from R3 to R. So the graph would live in four dimensions. So the graph of this function F would live in four dimensions. There's no way for us to visualize that. But we can start visualizing the level sets here. And we can, in fact, visualize like how they change as C changes. OK, so you could change the value of C and, um, and kind of see that here. OK, cool. So um, and that's exactly what um, I think I mentioned on the next slide. So we can. We can use the, uh, the level sets to get an idea of what the graph looks like. Um, so we can use level sets. Really, what we're not necessarily using is a, one specific level set for a function, is we're looking at all of the different level sets of the function and how they, the level sets change as you change the value of C. Okay. So I think to visualize this best, 
you know, I think, you know, if you look in the textbook and if what we're going to do on the next slide is actually kind of the classic way we do this. Um, but before we jump into that, I want, I think I want to just show you a better example um, using kind of modern tools where we would, um, uh, how I would do it, you know, without necessarily plotting everything. So if we think of the example, um, right, um, f of x or f of x squared, sorry, uh, f of x, y is equal to x squared plus y squared. Now this one, I'm using this because we know what the graph already looks like. It's this big paraboloid, right? But the question is, what if I didn't know that? How could I go ahead and look at a graph and or, or, or use level sets to try to get a picture of what this graph looks like, okay? So to do this, I'm gonna look at, um, uh, I'm gonna use a graphing calculator again. Okay, so let me switch here, this to this. Okay, so can everyone see this? So now this one I've switched to Desmos, which I think it's getting, again, getting cut off, but up here it says Desmos, or you can see it down here, powered by Desmos. Okay, which is similar to GeoGebra. These are the two main graphing tools I use. Um, but it, Desmos is just a little bit easier to use. Um, and that function x squared plus y squared, what we're going to do is we're going to plot x squared plus y squared. Is equal to C. And now it's going to give me this button that says add a slider and I'm going to go ahead and do that. And you see it defaults to C equals one. And what that what this is now, well, now what we're looking at, uh, let me put this in projector mode and um, and then I'll zoom in just a little bit. Um, I think I'm actually, I can also change the color here just to make it a little easier to see. Okay, so you can see at C equals one, we got this circle of radius one. But the other thing we can do is we can press play here and it's gonna animate for us the level sets changing. And you can see, um, in fact, when we get to negative numbers, the graph disappears, that's because we're never gonna get a negative number out here. If you remember the actual 3D graph of the shape, it's the, the, the bottom of it was sitting on the X, Y plane at Z equals zero. And there was no graph below that point. So that's what it's telling us here, right? There's nothing below the X, Y plane. Then once we get to zero, let's see if we can actually get there, if it'll show us anything. Um, it looks like there's nothing, but if you look really closely, there's a point there. There's a little blue point there. You can probably just barely make it out on the graph there, but it's it's there. Um, um, and you can see it there. But the more interesting thing is as we, oh, it's going the wrong direction. And let's, um, as we pass zero here, the the value of, of uh, C, as the value of C changes, I can change this and this to go up to maybe 20. Um, and so, yeah, so if we start at zero and press play, then you can see as this gets bigger, uh, the radius is just getting bigger. And what you can picture is happening um, in, the, in 3D space is we have that graph and we have a plane which uh, oops, um, starts at the base, at the base little tip of that paraboloid. Oops. Okay, here it's at the tip of the paraboloid. And then when I hit play, that plane is moving up the graph. So it's moving up the graph and it's giving us bigger and bigger circles. But notice it is, is almost slowing down at, uh, at first, right? or at towards the end there, right? It starts slowing down how fast uh, the radius gets uh, increases, right? And that has to do with the, uh, the fact that it's a paraboloid and not just like, it's not just going straight out like a cone, it's going like a paraboloid. Um, so it starts slowing down as things, as things um, get bigger. And in fact, we could even go higher, like go crazy and go up to a hundred and, you know, we can start to see that and it gets, yeah, it gets big. There you go. Um, okay, so this is how I would picture, you know, um, level sets here. This is what's happening. It's, you know, I like to picture it as like this animation that's happening. But, you know, the old school way to do it before we had, you know, I, anyone could just go online and get like a 
fancy graphing calculator for free. Um, the way we do this, we just draw a bunch and, and, you know, also, this is also useful information because like on a quiz, you can't just like turn in a link to Desmos, right? Um, or like on homework or something. Um, but in, uh, you know, the way we'd actually do this is we draw a bunch of the level sets all on the same picture. So um, here, what I can do, oh, and I'm, I do want to give you guys a break soon. So after this, I draw this picture, we can take a little break, okay? So here, um, what we can do is we can say, hey, we can draw the X, Y plane and we can just draw a few level sets. Um, and like on, a, like on the homework, I think there's some examples of, it gives you specific values of C to use. I'm not gonna necessarily give you specific values of C in this um, for here for the notes, but on a problem, like if we were giving you like a good problem, it would tell you like certain notes. So here we label like, hey, this is C equals zero. And then we'd say, okay, uh, oh no, I don't want to change that. I want to change, I'm going to turn that on and say, okay. Let's see. Okay, that's C equals, oops, ah. Um, C equals one, okay. Um, and then the thing at C equals two is that it's, uh, it, the radius isn't two, it's a little bit smaller, right? And so it's like square root of two. So it's like around, uh, this is like C equals three and I'm gonna have to intersect that or C equals two, C equals, oops, C equals three. And I'm, I've kind of stopped labeling them here. C equals three and C equals four, okay? So not doing a great job of keeping them centered, but basically you can see this, we're getting bigger and bigger circles, but the circles are also getting closer and closer together as you get further out. So notice the jump from C equals zero to C equals one was huge. Then the C equals one to C equals two is not as huge. To C equals three is even less huge. To C equals four is even less huge. Okay, and that's just gonna keep happening as you go. That's because the radius is the square root of um, kind of C here. Yeah, it's, it's exactly equal to the square root of C. So the distance is gonna shrink and shrink and shrink, okay? Yeah, exactly. So we graph each, we graph the function with different values of C. So we're graphing, um, graphing, Uh, a bunch of level sets with different values of C. Now on like a homework problem or something, it's gonna tell you which values to use. It's gonna say like use negative one, negative two, negative three, zero, one, two, three, or something like that. Um, but for this example, I just kind of showed you here, look, take some, Take some points here. Does that make sense? We're gonna do one more example before we, um, after the break, um, before we move on to the next section, okay? The last thing I did was draw this little level set for you. Um, the next thing I wanna do is uh, draw a level set for something like this. Now, normal, like I said, if, you, if this were to come up like on a quiz or on a homework problem, they'd give you certain values of C to look at, okay? But here I just wanted to point out just a few values of C um, and then see if we can uh, try to guess a little bit about what the graph will look like. Because I think this one's a little trickier, um, though it does give you quite a bit of information, the level sets. Um, um, do, 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 do. Uh, let me uh, draw my coordinate plane here. So um, I'll make it nice and big. Oops. So we have our y-axis and our x-axis, okay? So we have that. Um, and if we start looking at values of C, for example, let's look at C equals zero. Then we get x squared minus y squared equals zero, okay? 
So this is one of these that it's like at first glance, this might, you might not know what this shape is. So this one, let's fiddle around with and see if we can make it work. Well, this is y squared equals x squared, right? I can just move the y squared to the other side. Um, so you might think, oh, that's just x, y equals x, right? But there's a little, there's something missing here, right? It's missing some information because something else can happen because these squareds, right? What happens when we take square roots of both sides? What should we tack on? Right, any time, yeah, plus or minus, right? Minus, plus, plus, minus, right? Because basically what's happening here is, what this is actually saying is that, um, so it's like when I square Y and when I square X, I get the same thing, which doesn't mean that they're the same. It just means that they, uh, they might have, they might be, have different signs, but they're the same absolute value is what we'd call that, right? And so what is the graph of Y equals plus or minus X? Well, it's just the graph of Y, uh, y equals X and the y, a graph of y equals negative x at the same time. And so the, those graphs are um, these lines. And so you have this here and, and this. So this whole set here, it's this x that goes along. Ah, oops. There we go. Pretend that that it's in the right spot. Let's do something like that. Okay, so it's this. This here is our c equals zero here. So this is uh, c equals zero. Everything you see here, the whole x is c equals zero. Now, what if I change that to c equals one? Then I get x squared minus y squared equals one. Okay. Now, what kind of shape is that? Anyone remember what kind of shape that is? Okay. So this is one of these conic sections, if you remember conic sections. Um, so this one happen, actually happens to be a hy uh, hyperbola, which you might remember. So um, when I graph this, it's actually like something that looks like, uh, ooh, I'm gonna have a bad time drawing this. Okay, so we have something like, this. And it's also mirrored on the other side. So, oh, I drew this at the wrong point, actually. Um, that should be x equals one. We'll just label it like that. It's x equals one, and this is x equals negative one. And yeah, you just have these kind of uh, curves that kind of follow these lines here. Okay. Make sense, right? So uh, this here, and I should label this as c equals one, okay? The confusing part is that this is part of c equals one, this over here, okay? So if you remember how to graph hyperbolas, um, basically this point is gonna determine this value here, okay? Because if you think about it, that's at y equals zero, if you Plug in y equals zero, you get x squared equals one. And that's how you get um, x equals one or negative one. And so at c equals two, this is gonna look kind of similar, but you get it, you plug it in somewhere at like a square root of two. So this is at x equals square root of two, and you get something like this again, okay? So you can draw that like that. And again, my drawing skills are only so good. We'll look at the Desmos uh, after. So we, get, so we can kind of get a picture of what's going on. Okay. 
Now, what haven't we tried yet? Well, we tried zero, we tried one, we tried two. We can keep going to try three, but you think you can get the picture. It's just going to move out here and it's just going to keep kind of doing this. Okay. What haven't we tried? So we tried zero, one, two, yeah, negative, negative numbers. So what if we try C equals negative one? Okay. Before in those other examples that uh, in this example, it didn't, negatives didn't matter, but in this one, negatives might matter. In general, negatives might, might do something. So here we do X squared minus Y squared equals negative one. So now we can, uh, you can think of this a couple of different ways and you can try to figure out what this looks like, right? But basically what's happening here is um, you can rewrite this equation as y squared minus x squared equals one, right? Multiply both sides by negative and you get something like this, um, which looks a lot like this, except that roles of x and y are switched, which just means that, um, oh, so I should have labeled this c equals two. Um, basically that we're gonna get the same kind of hyperbolas, but kind of up and down instead of left and right. Okay, so you get something like, this. So this is at C equals negative one. And again, it also is down here. Okay. Okay. C equals negative two, as you can imagine, is going to be very similar, except uh, very similar to going from here to here, except we're going from here to something like here. Okay, this is C equals negative two. If I was better at drawing, this would look even better. The more precise you are, the better it looks. Okay, and again, we can keep going. And so we get this kind of picture, we have this X and then we have these kind of curves that go up. Okay, a couple of ways we can make this picture better. Again, if I just was more careful about how I, if I was better at drawing curves, Another thing you can do is maybe add color, right? Maybe say like the more we go to negative infinity, the darker it gets, the more we go to positive infinity, the lighter it gets. And then it kind of gives you this picture just instead of all looking the same color, it kind of changes color. So you can kind of see which parts correspond with which level sets, okay? So that's one way to do it. That's one way to add in some of the features because what we're ultimately trying to do is encapsulate that whole animation that Desmos does except just on a single picture, okay? And there's different ways to do that. You could just draw it. This is the most basic way and label it. Um, but the more, but I think, you know, adding some color would be really cool, like making it darker as it goes from the lowest number to the highest number or vice versa, making it lighter, um, starting with something dark and making it lighter. That's cool. Something like that would, I think would, would be pretty cool. Um, you can also add more steps in between. Like we could have done C and then what C equals zero, C equals one half, C equals one, C equals one and a half, C equals two. Okay, and that adds even more. And that like would would, would look really cool. Um, and yeah, and there's like other ways to do it too. You can, you know, again, you know, I think one of the biggest things we could do is just make these pictures better. Okay, cool. So let's, before we move on to the next section, um, let's just quickly look at the what the level set would look like for or what the Desmos animation would look like for um, this um, here. So you see here, I've got X squared minus Y squared equals C and I've changed this C here to be that. So right here, this was the C equals one level set. If I go to C equals zero, you can see that that's there. So I'm gonna start at C equals negative 10. So you can see we have this kind of really wide curve that's way up here. Then if I press play, it kind of gets closer and closer and then it kind of pops and it does the other thing. So what we're seeing in the animation that maybe we didn't quite see from just the picture is that that C equals zero just happens for the blink of an eye. Right? You like in the animation, you can't even see it unless I really slow it down and I can see it there. And that, that point is almost where it goes from being up and down to being left and right, right? And that's kind of, in order for go to go from these curves to these curves, you kind of have to connect and then disconnect in the other direction. And that's what's happening there at C equals zero. That's why something weird is happening there. Um, but even without seeing the animation, this one looks unlike any of the other level sets. So you should already think something is weird is happening here at C equals zero. 
at this at this point here, especially something weird is happening there. And it takes a little more calculus and we'll get to that in the later in the week, maybe uh, uh, early next week as well to see exactly what weirdness is happening here. Cool. Yeah, so Desmos, GeoGebra, good tools for, for doing all of this, like investigating all of this stuff, okay? Let's switch back to this. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, this is the difference between the Desmos and you know what I can physically draw uh, myself. Okay, cool. So now I'm gonna switch. We're gonna switch gears for the last. Uh, you know, I was hoping 20. It looks more like 15 minutes. Um, I'm gonna switch to the next section. Okay. So this is section 2.2 from the textbook. It's about limits and continuity. So you remember back to our warm up problem at the beginning of class today. I, it was a limit. So this is why that came up. Um, because I want to talk a little, we're going to talk about limits today. Okay. In particular, we're going to talk about higher dimensional limits. So I want to start by looking at um, the definition of a limit according to our textbook. So this is not a small definition. This is a big honking definition here for us to look at. Okay. And it starts by defining what it means to eventually be in a certain set as X approaches this. And, you know, you have, um, you know, you have a bunch of stuff here, you know, a, a bunch of machinery for this. And I'm not asking, you know, the reason I, you know, I cited my sources here so that you don't have to write this whole paragraph down right now. You know, you have the textbook as well. If you want to either take a screenshot of this or take a, find it in the textbook and take a screenshot of that. Um, either way, you know, and then just paste this and, you know, you know, just have this for later. Um, you can, you can kind of annotate it here, but I want to kind of highlight, you know, um, what the main point of a limit is. So first of all, in the textbook, they like to write the full word limit instead of just LIM, which is the more common way to do it. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, so if we're writing this, um, let me use it. I'm going to use a darker color. So it shows up on this lighter background. Um, so we're writing, we either write the limit as X approaches zero of F of X equals B or F of X approaches B as X approaches X naught. Okay. So these are like two ways of writing this and this are two ways of writing the same thing. But what does that actually mean? Again, you can sit here and you can study and you can unpack all of this. Um, and if, if you're like a math major, I strongly encourage you to do something like that. Like, cause that's something that's going to come up. You know, that's like something that you should, you should, have some good, a good understanding of, but I think it, for us as a class to sit here and like go through and try to pick up on all of this um, would take some time. And I don't think it's the, the necessarily the best use of our, our time here. I think a good thing to take away is that uh, F that we can interpret this to mean as X is close to X sub zero, then F of X is close to B, right? This is pretty standard to how we were thinking of limits back in our calculus class, right? You may remember something having to do with epsilons and deltas, like an epsilon delta definition. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, again, the proper definition. Um, but just think that, you know, these, these letters, notice they're bold, right? They can be living in, in, in higher dimensional space. So we can have Rn and Rm, as you can see up here. Um, these, are, these are higher dimensional spaces. And so um, some pictures I'll draw that are also in the textbook um, or, or versions of this are in the textbook is basically, what you can see is that um, basically if we, let's see, draw kind of a coordinate grid here or a space, okay. Okay. Um, if you have like sort of some, like if you have your point here on the X, Y plane, this is X sub zero, right? What we're doing is we're, we're saying, as we approach this, what is the function f of x approaching? So we have something like, if f of x does something like, like this, then as we approach x naught, x sub zero, what happens um, up here in the f of x? and the graph of f of x, right? What is happening to the graph of f of x? So this is x here, it's approach, or this is 
f of x, I guess. Right. The difference in higher dimensional in higher dimensions is that we can approach x naught from a variety of directions. Okay. We don't have to approach it just from a certain direction, right? Like, for example, in in single variable calculus, we can say we can approach from the left or we can approach from the right. Right. There's only two options. But in higher dimensions, here this is this would be uh, in two variables. This would be a, a function. This the graph I have here is a scalar valued function in two variables. Um, but the, because it's in two variables, you think, oh, that just like maybe doubles the directions we could come from. But no, we can come from these two. We can come from these two. We can come at an angle. We can kind of come in a spiral and kind of do this. So the way we typically draw it is we have this rate, this, this kind of ball around X naught, and it kind of closes in on the set, okay? Or on the point, I should say, sorry. We're kind of closing in on this point and we're seeing, okay, what happens as this ball closes in? What happens upstairs to f of x as this closes in? You know, does this, what, does this close into something? That's what the limit is saying. Or, uh, kind of saying well, something like this. Maybe a point here, okay? So that's an important, an important catch, right? So let me maybe, I, could, I think that's worth mentioning. So catch, if you're like using your intuition to just like, we, as we approach X naught, as X approaches X naught, what does F of X approach? Just remember that X can approach X naught, from many directions. In fact, infinitely many, but we'll just say many directions. So if you just say, well, what if, what if I just look at from this specific angle and you say like, oh, and if I look at it from, as it approaches from this place, um, well then in that case, the, um, the limit exists. Well, just because it exists coming from this angle doesn't mean it's going to exist coming from this angle, or even if it exists coming from both angles, it doesn't mean that you're going to get the same limit in from coming in from both angles, right? Which is one of the ways we're going to actually prove uh, that, a, that certain limits don't exist, is we're going to approach it from two different angles, and we're going to say, hey, we got different things by approaching from two different angles, okay? And I'm saying angles, but we're not really going to use, like, angle stuff most of the time. It's going to be, like, it's going to be different stuff. We'll, 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 we'll see the techniques in a little bit, but I think the important takeaway from here is you can, you know, there's this fancy, this fancy definition exists and you should know that this fancy definition exists, even if you don't fully understand it, but we should, we can't, we're allowed to just kind of take it as, as X approaches X naught, what does F of X approach? That's kind of what a limit is asking about, but just remember the catch with that sort of intuition is that we can approach in higher dimensions, we can approach from many directions. It can kind of come in from any angle, okay? And so what you don't want to do is like in, in single variable calculus, you, a valid way of computing a limit is compute it from the left, then compute it from the right. And if they're the same, you're done, right? But here that wouldn't be possible. There's no way to compute it from the left and from the right, right? Because if you compute it from the left and the right, you'd also have to compute it from the top and the bottom and this angle and coming in from a spiral and all of this other stuff, right? So there's no, there, there, you, would, you would never be done because there's infinitely many ways you can approach the, uh, the point. Have I driven my point home enough? Have I beaten the dead horse enough? Any questions on that? Okay, cool. Let's see some properties of limits, okay? This is all kind of abstract. And so like these are kind of more concrete into kind of how we're gonna actually go about some techniques for computing limits, right? Basically, we can use some, some basic limits that I'm gonna show in the next slide, which we might not get to today. Um, uh, and we're gonna prove, we're gonna use some basic limits and then these properties, and then we can combine them to see that we can compute a lot of different types of limits. Okay, along with techniques from single variable calculus. 
like L'Hopital's rule and stuff like that. Um, okay, so first of all is uniqueness, which is like something that almost feels like it doesn't need to be said, but mathematically, technically, it needs to be said um, because it's not technically clear from this definition that maybe a limit as x approaches x naught, maybe f of x approaches two different things. It seems like it, sh it shouldn't be possible, but remember, like math is weird and like the things don't always work out the way you expect them to, though in this case, it does work out the way you expect them to. So if, if the limit approaches A and the limit approaches B, then A and B should have been the same thing all along. So A should equal B. Okay, that you're never gonna have a limit which approaches two different things. Okay. Um, and the rest of these are kind of um, uh, a little more useful. This one's just kind of like covering our, you know, like making sure we're like covering our bases, like, okay, we've made like, you know, limits behave the way you expect them to. This, this is in the most basic way here. Um, these are also partial kind of that, but also a little more interesting. Um, so if I take the limit of a constant times a function, um, in this case, this C is, I should, I should maybe label it even up here. C is um, a real number, so just a scalar. Um, this symbol comes up sometimes in the homework. I, you know, I should mention it here. Uh, this just means that this is an element of this set, which means that C is a real number. So C is in here. It kind of take it as, this means is this thing is in this thing, okay? This is the set of real numbers. So this is just saying C is a real number. Um, then this is just C times the limit as X goes to X naught of F of X. So kind of how you expect it to work, right? If you have, uh, you can move constants scalars to the outside, which is nice. Um, one other thing that, oh, actually I think I'll mention that after. Um, so you can move scalars to the outside. Also, if you take the limit of a sum, then you just get the sum of the limits, right? You can break up a limit over addition. Now there's a big asterisk hanging over us here. Like there's one as a big assumption I'm making. Uh, well, the big assumption I'm making here in both of, in all of these is that the limits as X goes to X naught of F of X and the limit as x goes to x naught of g of x, uh, they both exist. Assume both of these limits exist. Okay. Uh, now that seems like, oh, okay, well, yeah, I mean, that seems kind of silly. But if you remember from calculus class, it was very common for, for limits to not exist, right? Like that was uh, quite common in, in, in the calculus class. And it's, it's not any less common here. Like you're still gonna get many com uh, limits that don't exist. So a common thing you can, uh, or a common way that comes up is if you have two, lim two uh, objects which uh, their limits don't exist and you add their, or two functions whose limits don't exist and you add their, the, the functions together, this limit might not exist or this limit might exist, but it might it won't be equal to this sum because these two limits don't exist separately. So it doesn't make sense to break up the limit like that, okay? Um, and if you do, you can't just say, well, this one doesn't exist, this one doesn't exist. So adding them together doesn't exist. So you can't, you can't conclude that this doesn't exist just because the parts don't exist, okay? That's a common way that that comes up, okay? Um, um, another thing here, uh, um, this last, or this, this next one here, um, it might be, I think it's going to be the last one for today. I think I want to save this one for um, the next one or for next, uh, for tomorrow. But this last one here, if M is equal to one, right? There's this little extra caveat here. 
for this one. Then right over here, we said that the, the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. <clears throat> now we have the limit of a product. So this is probably, this is gonna be the product of the limits, but we had to throw on this, if M equals one business, the reason for that is because we're multiplying the outputs of these functions and multiplying only makes sense if you have real numbers, right? It doesn't make sense to multiply uh, uh, vectors together or, you know, like if these were vector valued functions, it wouldn't make sense to multiply their outputs because there's no way to multiply uh, vectors. Um, well, there's, there's things like the dot product and stuff, but that's, uh, that's kind of, that's, is not going to work well necessarily with the limits. And so this wants to specify specifically, if you're just talking about regular old multiplication of real numbers, then this works. Uh, works. Uh, you can break up the limit again, assuming the limits exist separately. Okay. Cool. Any questions on that? Any questions on this slide here? I'll, I'll leave it here for the rest uh, for the rest of class so that we can catch up. Um, so you can catch up on your writing um, as I wrap up here. Um, the one thing I want to point out is that notice all of these say x going to x naught um, and f of x. Technically, these it should be mentioned that these you know x and x naught are elements of uh, R n, right? These are these are not just numbers. X and x naught are not numbers. They're points in n-dimensional space, okay? And I just kind of use shorthand of, use the shorthand of just giving them one letter names, even though typically this would be like x comma y or x1, x2, x3, or something like that approach us. And then x naught would be a very specific point, it would be like, you know, like zero one or the origin zero, 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 or something like that. So just know that um, uh, these, even though they, I'm using single variable or single letters to represent them as variables. They represent points in n-dimensional space. Okay. Okay, cool. So we will call it a day here.